the book was inspired by a lot of things. Uh, partially, it was inspired by uh, my, one of my mentors at Harper Collins, a fellow named uh, Bill Morris, who had been there since they were called Harper Brothers. He'd been there for I think 50 years when he finally stopped and literally worked until he died. And uh, he was sick. I knew he was sick, and I went up to see him. And on the way, I wrote this this story about a guy who gives his life to books and made a play on Bill's name. Uh, Bill Morris became Morris less more. more Bill's a really kind of diminutive fellow, very dapper though. And uh, so, got went to his apartment, got to read him the book, and he really, you know, was touched by it, and, and he died like three days later. And uh, so, started working on the book, and then Hurricane Katrina happened, and um, just devastated my home state. And so, I would go into the shelters, and there are all these amazing groups that put together this effort to get books into the hands of, of these kids who were displaced, that were living in the shelters. Uh, Riff and, and First Book, we've got something like five million uh, books in the hands of these, these kids that were living in the shelters. And so you go into the shelter, and usually the shelter was like this giant coliseum, a sports arena kind of place, and there'd be you know thousands of cots set up, and that's where people were living for, for months. And so here are these kids, many of them who had never left their homes, maybe even never left their neighborhoods, but they were torn away from everything they knew and everything that was familiar, and they're living in these shelters with 10,000 other people and no privacy at all, and everything they know is gone. And it was an awful kind of existence for a while. And But what I saw time and time again was once kids got a book in their hand, they could, you just see them there sitting on these cots, totally absorbed, you know, and all that disruption, all that lack of privacy, all that unfamiliarity just sort of didn't matter. They had made this cone of escape while they're reading the book. So then that started to twine into the story as well, and that's how it all kind of came together. Okay, the, winning the Academy Award for our short film was, the, I've heard people talk about things like outer body experiences or something, and <laughs> I never really thought about it. But, you know, I'm, we're sitting there, and we're with all our fellow nominees. You know, they, everybody's sitting on the end row. So we're like ducks, right? One, two, three, four, five. You know. And I've got my son sitting next to me and my co-director and his wife. And a friend of mine who won an Oscar a few years ago said, your brain starts doing very unusual things in the last minutes before they announce your category and announce whether you won or not. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, I, I can't explain it, but your brain's going to do some very strange stuff. And and so, sure enough, they were they were getting to the short film categories and you know, they kind of grouped them together. And I just remember, I didn't hear anything anymore. It was just like, somebody turned the volume off. And everything just kind of went very narrow and focused. And I was staring the back of the head of the guy in front of me who was nominated along with us. And he actually, I thought, he had the best chance of winning. And and so I'm like, I can't hear anything anymore. And I can't, I'm not thinking thoughts. And so I'll just keep looking at that guy's head. And if he stands up, then I'll know we lost. Because I just wasn't hearing anything. And, and then I heard them tear the envelope, and you can't like every every category, no matter what, that place falls totally silent when they go to open the envelope. And you can hear the microphones right there; you can hear them. So I hear this, and then I hear the fantas, and this. That's all I heard. You know, I heard that, and then it's like my body, all my molecules separated, and I became a gas. I was not a solid form anymore. And from then on, like everything, my memories are just sort of, I'm sort of floaty. Like I turned to my son and gave him a hug. And then I remember walking down the carpet and just like, it didn't feel like I had feet or that there was gravity. And it was like I was a balloon or something. And, and then I got to the stage and then there was the girls from the bridesmaids, you know, reaching out and hoisting this Oscar at my direction. I was like, well, I guess I should take that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then, 
you know, stand there and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there going, I can't even remember, Brandon's behind me, my co-director, and you know, he's there, I'm like, okay. And so we turn and we, we had written a speech, they were very emphatic about, you should prepare a speech, but it should not sound like a speech, it should sound like you've come up with it on the fly. So, and only one of you can talk, but we had decided that we would both talk, we would like do this sort of call and response thing, so we'd both like, say this, and I'd say that, and Brandon would say this, and I would say that. And so there we are, and we look out, and you know, it's George Clooney and and Meryl Streep, and you know, every star in Hollywood, like from here to there, and looking up at us, and <laughs> I just went, I can't remember what our speech is, I have no clue. And then I remembered like the first three words of what we were going to say, and I said that, and I found the first sentence of what we're supposed to say, and then I turned to Brandon for him to and continue, and I'm like, maybe we'll start to remember. And then Brandon just kind of froze and repeated what I had said. <laughs> went, well, I guess, I guess all bets are off. And then I just started to babble. And they have this whole thing where they're like, you have 45 seconds, and they have this timer that's very prominent that you can see. And you're watching your seconds tick away, and they're like, when that goes, when it's gone, we turn your mic off, and the music comes up, and you'll look like an idiot if you keep talking. So don't just finish before that's done. So I'm sitting there going, okay, what am I saying? And and thank you, and this is great. And and oh my god, the second's running out. Oh my god, I can't remember my speech. It's in my hat. Should I take off my hat and get the speech? No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. just keep talking. Maybe you'll be okay. Don't say the F word. <laughs> just just talk. Just talk. Okay, now I think maybe you should be gone. You should just get out of here. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. And then we walk off and and, and then Brandon and I were both like, oh my god, oh my god, and we're staggering off stage. And I'm like, Brandon, did that happen? That really happened, and he goes, I think so, but I'm not sure. And we look, and off stage is standing Angelina Jolie with that leg mm -hmm. thing, you know, going on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, may, I think it must be true because I see Angelina Jolie's leg. And Brandon goes, why would that make anything true? And I'm like, I don't know, but it seems right somehow. <laughs> so, and from that point on, it was really, we were having fun anyway. I mean, we were like, this is going to be fun. We are not going to stress out about this. Or if we do stress out about it, we're going to have fun stressing. So we snuck a flask of vodka in with us, and we finished that thing off before our category even came up, and it didn't put a dent in I mean, it was if we were drinking water. And anyone else was talking about that for the kids' book? Anyway, so... Um, we can edit. <laughs> We, they took us from interview to interview. We talked to every star we came in within 70 yards of, and they were all incredibly gracious and nice and excited for us because we seemed like we were having so much fun because most people are going to be trying to be like, I don't know, dignified or something, and we were just the happiest two people I think who had ever won an Academy Award, and they seemed to really appreciate that. And, and we just had a ball. It sits on my bedside table. If I have a bad dream or if I'm anxious, I turn and I look and I'm like, everything's going to be okay. There, the Oscar's there. <laughs> and it has powers, I'm telling you. <laughs> it definitely has. If I get stuck, I hold it to my forehead and then suddenly I, you know, everything clears. So we went out that night and, and we're trying to cross Sunset Boulevard to go into you know, one of the parties. And you know, Sunset Boulevard is not a, you know, like a small you know, it's a main thoroughfare, and there's tons of traffic, and and I'm like, how are we gonna cross the street? And then I went, I, I know, I'll, I'll pull a Charlton Heston, and I held the Oscar out in front of me, and all the cars stopped, <laughs> and people got out of their cars and started taking pictures, and then we crossed the street, and you know, I was like, this thing has powers. You know, we wanted the book to come out first, but that just didn't know how it worked out, and, and now in this weird way, it seems like it's 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 good for the book, you know. People have an awareness of it and they've seen it either as the short film or they saw the Oscars and then saw it or they've seen the app. But you know, the whole thing was about bridging the gap or bridging the worlds really. I don't know if there's a gap. Just saying books and this new technology coexist. They're not, you know, in opposition to each other. One's not going to be the end of the others, I don't think, at all. I think it's actually kind of silly to think that. But they can complement each other, and so everything that we're trying to do at my company, Moonbot, is to prove that point. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Sure.